Hello all, this is Dr. Jeanette Nicewinter with a short lecture on ancient Mesopotamian art. So we are going all the way back to the beginning of what we call civilization, um, or at least in this area. So we're starting about 3500 BCE. So that is before the Common Era. So we're 3500 years before zero. And then we can work forward about 2020 years to get to the present day. So this is about 5,500 years before the present day. And we're talking about the area that we call Mesopotamia, which is the area between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in present day Iraq. You can see here that a lot of these cultures and their cities spring up along these fertile rivers um, so these are good places for farming and agriculture, things like that, that give birth, help give birth to the civilizations that um, took place here. So Mesopotamia is the general name for this area between the rivers. You might have also heard of Mesopotamia as the Fertile Crescent and the Cradle of Civilization. All of these terms are completely interchangeable. So the first couple cultures that we'll talk about, so we have the Sumerians who are down here, the Akkadians are about up here, but then they spread. And then the Akkadians fall and the Sumerians and the Babylonians are going to have a more, um, more prominence after the fall of the Akkadians. And then the Assyrians who are based actually a little bit further north up in Asher, it's where they're, um, they start and where they get their name from. So they are going to spread out from there all the way up and over through Syria down actually into what is present day Egypt. So that'll be after the height of the Egyptian culture, after the end of the New Kingdom. And then finally, you have the Persians who are going to start in present day Iran and of course go up and over all the way to the west and they're going to spend a lot of time trying to fight the Greeks. So you can see that we don't just start very far back, we actually have a really big time period that we could talk about with ancient Mesopotamia. So this is an area where we're seeing cultures rise and fall and having dis different socio-political um, proclivities and yet we have a couple of things that we can talk about as kind of holding them together culturally. Some overlaps that we'll see. So I'd like to start with the Sumerians. And we call the Sumerians our first real civilization. Of course, this is always up for debate. These categories are flexible and they are never absolute. But the Sumerians are going to found uh, our first city-states, they'll create a writing system called cuneiform, which they will not just use for their language, uh, subsequent cultures will also use this writing system. They're going to build Mesopotamian temples, which we're going to call ziggurats. They develop specialization of labor, and they'll present narratives in register format using hierarchy of scale. That's a lot of artistic and art historical mumbo jumbo in that last uh, bullet point. So we'll go ahead and look at some art in order to clarify what that means. But first let's talk about cuneiform. So cuneiform is a system of writing. So cuneiform is not the language. Cuneiform is um, similar to an alphabet. It's a system that's used to convey the language to the reader. You can see um, on the left side here that writing starts as pictographic writing. So this is where the image corresponds directly to the idea. So an image of a bull's head means bull's head. Image for a bull means bull. This becomes difficult um, when you see down here, the head and the bull together, well, is that eating, is that drinking? So it becomes more difficult to use pictographs when you have verbs, when you're trying to depict action. 
just to show you an example of pictographic cuneiform, you can see here. And a lot of times early cuneiform was used for administrative records. So the earliest forms of writing that we have, um, the earliest written records, are really not that exciting. They are primarily um, administrative. And of course, just remember we use pictographic writing all the time in the form of things like international signs. Uh, we use these a lot in electronics, things like that, right? If you're going to the airport in any country, you should be able to find it because of the picture of the plane. So it's not tied to the language itself, it's tied to the idea. As opposed to later cuneiform, so cuneiform then starts to develop. And we start to see these um, images, these pictographs, being broken down into these wedge-shaped symbols. These wedge-shaped symbols are made by using this uh, reed stylist, stylus and pushing it into wet clay. This is great because it's really cost effective, right? Both of these things are easy to find in nature and they're easy to um, reproduce. So early cuneiform will resemble a little bit of our pictographs. By the time we get to later cuneiform, it's actually going to be um, more abstracted and it's actually going to be tied to language. So later cuneiform becomes a logosyllabic where the image actually represents sound. So it's representing the syllables of the words and therefore it can accommodate all of these different languages, so Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, any of those as an alphabet. And we can see later cuneiform becomes very dense, very tight, and it's going to move from left to right. If we were looking at earlier cuneiform, it would move up to down, up and down. Um, later cuneiform will actually move left to right and you read each line. So cuneiform um, as it develops becomes used for things beyond administrative records things like narratives, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, originally uh, written in cuneiform. Cuneiform is used for a very long time. It actually lasts until about 70 CE. So it begins about 3400, goes through all of its developments, and lasts about 3400 years, a little over 3400 years. So our last written record is actually from under the Romans, written in cuneiform. The other first that we have for the Sumerians are ziggurats. So that's our Z word in the top left. And ziggurats are these elevated platforms for temples. It's thought that ziggurats developed because um, there was a desire to keep temples out of the floodplain to elevate them and keep them safe during these annual floods from the rivers. Because remember, we're living very close to those rivers um, to help sustain our populations. So the ziggurat is kind of the ceremonial and ritual center of these city-states. Each ziggurat is dedicated to a different god or goddess. And the temple that would have been on top, so we're not seeing a temple here, temple that would have been on top would have been conceived of as that deity's waiting room. So you would go there and you would wait to interact with that god or goddess. The ziggurat we're seeing here at Ur, um, this is actually a later Neo-Sumerian one, but it's the best example because it has been heavily reconstructed. So we can see um, just the size of these. They are quite large. They are solid and made of mud brick. And ziggurats um, have this bent access plan. So while you can go up one of these three staircases, you would then go into the temple, we think, on the opposite side. So while there is this big idea of kind of processing and entering the ziggurat um, and being seen, taken, taking your votive offerings to the god or goddess, um, then you would actually have to circumambulate the temple in order to enter. Ziggurats also have this black um, 
stripe along the bottom of bitumen, which is a tar-like pitch. And you can see here what a ziggurat would look like if it has not been reconstructed. So these are mud brick, which tend to melt in the rain. So at the bottom, we see a ziggurat um, that has had kind of a rough life. And then at the, the top, just an idea of what a temple might have looked like. The temple would have been made out of organic materials, such as wood. So of course, those no longer exist. Inside of those ziggurats, we have found statues of worshipers. We can call them sculptures as well. These are freestanding sculptures in the round. Um, this is a subtractive carving technique where you're removing the materials in order to create the image. And we can see here this kind of consistent style of representation. We have stylized face, um, very similar facial features with the smaller lips and the elongated nose. And then of course, looking at these figures, we see their very, very large eyes. Moving down the body, the bodies are pretty cylindrical. We don't have the sort of naturalism where we see the depiction of the body of the individual underneath the dress or underneath the man's kilt. They more so exist um, kind of over the body and they don't really lay on top of the body. And then the feet are nice and wide and kind of um, chunky in order to give a nice solid base for these figures. They are both clutching something in their hands, as you can see here. And those are probably cups that they're clutching. So um, cups in terms of offerings of maybe beer, so we do have fermented beverages during this period. Um, so maybe some sort of offering um, to the god or goddess. And like we said, these were found in a temple. So we believe that their eyes are so big so that they won't miss the god or goddess when they show up in the waiting room. So we think of these as being eternally wakeful. They're never going to fall down on their job of waiting for that god or goddess. We do have uh, many of these. And again, you can see this very consistent stylistic representation of the human form. They vary in terms of size and shape. They do seem to all have the emphasis on the eyes and then are all standing there clutching their offerings. It's possible that the difference in size and material is dependent upon the individual's status and wealth. The Sumerians are also um, giving to their gods in different forms. So we do see things like temple processions like we're seeing here. Um, so the giving of the offerings to this goddess Inanna who we can't see, but she's actually on the opposite side of this, the top of the vessel. And this is what we mean when we're talking about registers. So the work of A's is beautiful, but it's also a really great example of some of these early conventions or traditional ways of representing forms for not just the Sumerians, these get carried through the history of art. So a register are these horizontal bands that showed the narrative. So they help break up the narrative into kind of these easily digestible chunks. And registers normally, like we said, they're horizontal and you wanna think of them um, almost like little film strips is how I think of them. So they all relate, but they're a little separate. For the registers we see here, all the way down the bottom, we have the river. You can see water down the bottom. We then have plants in the next register, rams and ewes processing around the next one. In the center register, well, notice we have a blank register in order to divide the space in between. Uh, give your eye a little bit of a break there. In that middle register, you have servants who are carrying both food in the baskets 
and then these big jugs of um, drink, probably beer, another uh, blank register, and then at the very top you can see all of the goods and offerings that have been taken to the goddess who, as we said, is on the opposite side of this vessel. This vessel is large. It is again a sculpture. It is a relief sculpture. So you have those figures projecting out from the background. Um, so a three foot tall alabaster vase, probably very, very important and very elite of an object. One of the most famous excavations that we have from the Sumerians is at Ur. So this is that ziggurat. And you can see here um, the renovated staircase, but also just the sheer like size and mass of these temple platforms that are being built by the Sumerians. So this one begun in the late third century BCE and renovated about 1500. So again, I'm kind of combining the Sumerians and the Neo-Sumerians, even though there would have been a little um, temporal break in there. And I really love uh, the burials that they found at Ur because of um, this individual. So she's called Queen Puabi. We're not quite sure if she was actually a queen or maybe just a noble woman or an elite. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly what the socio-political um, hierarchy was for the Sumerians in the city-state. Remember, each city-state does have their own. But she was buried with just an insane amount of gold. So this was a joint expedition between the British Museum and the University of Pennsylvania up in Philadelphia. And you can see just these, uh, this elaborate headdress that she has in this reconstruction, right? And this is all metal that has been just um, pounded to this very fine, very malleable material so that the leaves are just so, as they're as thin as leaves, right? They're going to move with her and they're going to catch the sunlight. You can see the precious um, stones as well. So the lapis lazuli and the carnelian and just like how much wealth she was buried with. Another object that comes from that same burial is what we call the standard of ore. It was called a standard because it was originally thought that it would have been carried into battle. We're not quite sure if that's the case anymore. That seems um, a little silly. It's really not that big of an object. We now think maybe it might have been placed on a table, something like that used as decoration. But it's interesting because we see two sides of Sumerian life. We see the war side on um, this side, and then we can look at the peace side on the opposite side. So we are continuing with those registers. So we have these horizontal bands that divide the narrative. That bottom register is showing us a war scene. So we have these chariots and the horses trampling the enemies below them, kind of these victorious individuals seated on the back of the chariot. And then the soldiers are coming home victorious. And you can see on the right hand side of that middle register, they're victoriously coming home with their captives, which continue at the top and they all face the leader. So the leader um, unfortunately isn't as well preserved as some of the other parts of this object. But we can clearly see that this is the leader because of how tall he is. So this is something uh, called hierarchy of scale or hierarchical scale. That the largest person is the most important. So it's a visual convention. It's a traditional way of representing forms that tells us that this is the most important figure. And you can see clearly, one, he's taller than everybody else, but also look at how much taller he is than his groom um, who's standing behind him tending to the horses. The other way you could tell that that's the most important person is because everybody's looking at him. So we can follow those sight lines, those implied lines um, by those figures and follow them to that individual in the center. On the opposite side, we see a peaceful scene 
where again we have a procession but this time they're bringing the food or what will become the food for this lavish banquet that that ruler is having. You can see the ruler in the top left right here seated and then again all of the attendants are looking at him. He is the tallest person and um, he is kind of facing against them. You can also see um, he has kind of the fanciest kilt as well. What I think is really cool is that we see depictions of music, right? So this might have been a fun party with music and dancing and drinking. And that depiction of music is interesting because they were able to recover this bullheaded harp that looks very similar to the bullheaded harp depicted on that standard of ore. The everything except for the wood is original. So um, they had to do some complex archeological maneuvers to even figure out the shape of this object because the wood had completely deteriorated. But we again see very elite materials. So gold, lapis lazuli, and then the red limestone and shell. Um, and showing these depictions of humans and animals um, and kind of this world reversal where the humans act like animals. This is my favorite object from the burial. Um, it is a ram in a thicket. It is just that. But I love the naturalism of it because this is what rams do, right? They forage for food in thickets. They hop up on their back legs, put their front legs in the thicket and kind of go to town. So I love the naturalism of it. I love the way that you get these different textures um, with the shell on the, or not, um, on the ram's body. So it's just really, um, I think, pretty adorable. So the Sumerians are conquered in 2332 by a group called the Akkadians. The Akkadians are coming from further north. And these um, Akkadians are going to be kind of the first group to call themselves kings. So we really see this ebb and flow in Mesopotamia between these strong city states and larger groups that um, actually develop into empires. After the Akkadians, we'll look at the Babylonians and we'll look at um, our first written law code. So probably the most, the most famous Akkadian artwork is the one you see here. This is a monument to the victory of Naram-Sin, so the figure that you see at the top, Naram-Sin over a group of people called the Lullabies. And you can see that Naramsen is depicting himself very kind of proudly, chest up, his hand against his chest, kind of striding forward. He does have a headdress with two horns on it, signifying that he is a deity. He is a godlike figure. This is the first time where we do see kings in Mesopotamian art that are showing themselves as having godlike powers. Um, so he um, really takes advantage of that here. The suns or stars at the top possibly represent those deities kind of shining down on him and um, you know, congratulating him in his victory. And then his troops are following behind him very proudly and victoriously. Underneath Naramson's feet, we can start to see, though, that this was not a good time for everybody. We have the figures of the Lullabies who are actually fleeing and trying to get away from Naramson. So you can see two figures over here running away and like not taking their eyes off of him. And then the figure here who has been punctured and is kind of falling backwards. And then you actually have two figures falling down the mountain. So you have this figure here doing this elaborate backbend. And then down the bottom, another figure whose head is coming down the mountain. Their feet are all the way up here. And they're um, essentially just free falling at that point. 
So this clear depiction of the power of Naramsin and the power of the Akkadians that can really be contrasted with this depiction of Hammurabi. So Hammurabi is the king of Babylon. Babylon is a city and he is going to set up this law code and have everybody kind of follow it. So this is our first real like codification of the law. We have a couple previous law codes from the Sumerians, but they're not as kind of in depth and they certainly weren't written down um, in this way. So we have Hammurabi at the top and the top left. He is seated facing a god and then the god is handing him a rope and a coil. So essentially the um, tools which he's going to use to measure the lives of his citizens. You can see that the god is also wearing a horned helmet. He has more horns than uh, Naram Siddin did, which means he is way more important. And then Hammurabi taking those objects um, and kind of putting his hands in deference to the god. So Hammurabi here really visually reinforcing his right to um, put these laws onto his citizens. So you imagine for the first written law code, people might balk at it and say, like, how do you have this authority? And he says, well, I have this authority because the God gave me this authority. So he's really re visually reinforcing that idea. Underneath Hammurabi and the God, we have 3,500 lines of text written in cuneiform. Um, the Babylonian language, that detail the punishments for people if they do certain things. So things like everything from letting your field go uh, fallow. So there's a lot of kind of agriculture information. But there's also things like what happens if you cheat on your spouse. The punishments for these different um, for these different infractions are going to be based upon the individual's gender and their place in society. So if you are wealthy, you will be treated one way. If you are poor or a servant, you will be treated another way. If you're a man, you'll be treated one way. And if you're a woman, you'll be treated another way. So these laws are very specific about um, the sort of punishment. Punishment tends to be kind of corporeal. So things like an eye for an eye. So if you poke out someone's eye, your eye will be poked, poked out. So that's where we get that phrase from, is from Hammurabi's law code, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It comes from here. And then um, there's also things like you have to pay back a certain amount of money um, if you do harm to someone or if you do harm to their land or their property, you might have to pay them in order to make up for that. So I'd like to finish up with the Assyrians. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Persians because that is a whole other kind of conversation. And personally, um, I think the Persians belong more in a chapter about the ancient Mesopotamian, ancient Mediterranean versus um, coming in here with the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Assyrians. Um, they were just really, they're a little bit later, and they really interact with more of those Mediterranean groups. So you can see here the Assyrians are based in Asher, and they kind of grow in two phases. So they have this first empire, which is the darker green that you're seeing, and then that contracts, and then you have the second empire when they come back just huge. They come back and they are able to really conquer a huge area. Um, like I said, all the way up and down into Egypt. And of course, everybody's not just trying to get to Egypt, trying to, they're also trying to get to the natural resources that are south of Egypt. So the Assyrians are, um, I'll show you our little slide. Our Assyrians are going to rule through military might and power. 
They are a very strong military group. They also do value writing. They value scholarship. They, of course, value art, or we wouldn't be talking about them. But what we see in a lot of their art are military campaigns and kind of glorifying the um, empire and the leader of that empire. So this is a citadel for the Assyrians. And you can see a couple of um, things we've already talked about, such as the ziggurat. So we'll continue to use that ziggurat, use that elevated platform for a temple. And then these are going to be um, citadels, which are kind of fortified palaces. So there are reception halls, residential complexes, but also really thick defensive walls. I want to talk about some of those um, architectural features that they've included in their citadels. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Lamasus, um, just because I think they're so cool. So this is a Lamasu. Well, we're actually seeing two of them here. And I love this photograph of them in situ or in the place where they were originally put. You can see the figure standing here just barely comes up to this uh, Lamasu's belly. So a Lamasu is a man-headed winged bull. We know that these figures are um, gods, they're deities, because look at that horned helmet, right? So it has this elaborate helmet, two horns on either side. So important, but not the most important. And these are kind of a high relief sculpture. They're normally found, or at least this one was found, um, in the corner. So that you get two really great perspectives looking at the Lamasu. You have the perspective from the front, which we can see here, where it looks like the Lamasu is standing still. But as you then start to walk past the Lamasu, you see that it's also walking out to greet you. So it also has four legs on the side that look like they're in motion. So the Lamasu actually has five legs in order to give you these two separate perspectives. The textures on the Lamasu are also really great. You have this stylized texture of the hair and the beard of the man's face coming out down into the stylized texture of the bull's body. And then of course you have the texture of the wings at the top as well. So I think these are great. Um, I just think they're adorable. And Lamasu is obviously not meant to be adorable, meant to be more ferocious than anything. Um, and they are guardian figures. So they're guarding these citadels and doing so in terms of if you are coming with um, good intentions, then the Lamasu is coming out to greet you. If you're coming with ill intentions, then the Lama is going to guard the citadel. Inside of the palace itself, um, inside of these citadels, there would have been relief panels just like this one. So these low relief panels would have gone all the way around a lot of these reception halls at the palaces of the Assyrians. Especially on um, this one at Nineveh is probably the most famous. Also in the British Museum, as many things are. And they're a little hard to read now. And we have to imagine this in situ in relationship to all of those other um, relief panels. So this would have been this long continuous narrative that we would have been able to see. Um, and again, would have been painted, would have been brightly colored. So it would have also made it easier to read in that way as well. What we're seeing here is Ashurbanipal who is our Assyrian leader. You can see him in the chariot, facing forward, holding out his arrow, or holding out his bow. He has completely strung it, it is taut. He's facing forward, kind of directing our eye to the left to continue down this narrative. However, behind him, he has left in his wake a bunch of dead lions. So this is Ashurbanipal during a lion hunt. 
and you can see the lions um, have many arrows sticking out of them. The figures in the chariot have to um, take down that one lion with a spear because it's so ferocious and you can just see the ferocity in the lion's face and the rendering of its fur. And of course, in the depiction of its musculature, um, I always see it really in the paws and kind of those four legs, four arms, however you want to call them, that this is a ferocious lion that Ashurbanipal has taken down. However, Ashurbanipal would not have just woken up on a Saturday morning and gone out into the wild to hunt lions. These are lions that have been captured and kept at the palace for this purpose. They're also being um, kind of driven towards the chariot, towards Ashurbanipal, and that's what you're seeing with the figure in the top right on the horse. That figure's job is to corral the lions and to keep them coming um, towards Ashurbanipal. So this is a very controlled environment. And the purpose of the lion hunt was for Ashurbanipal to show, and other Assyrian rulers, um, to show his power, show his might. So the hunting is associated with warfare, which we said um, the Assyrians were big on, but it's also this idea of controlling nature and placing the power of civilization and culture over that of nature. So it's kind of this idea of order over chaos. And then lastly, um, I just think this is such a cool piece of history that when Saddam Hussein was in power, he appropriated the images of ancient Mesopotamia. So you can see Saddam Hussein here showing himself with the law code of Hammurabi, showing himself with, um, this is called the Ishtar Gate. This is the person who commissioned it, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, yes, like from the Matrix. Um, so that's a Neo-Babylonian construction and ruler that we're seeing there. And then he, um, he being Saddam Hussein, actually reconstructed some of these ziggurats, some of these Sumerian buildings. So there was this kind of ideological push in the 20th century by Hussein to associate his rule of Iraq with kind of the glory of these Mesopotamian cultures. So um, there's that really interesting kind of overlay and appropriation of Mesopotamian cultures that happens in the 20th century. So that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.